Well, hello and welcome back to my careers podcast where I interview fascinating professionals who've made amazing career changes. Now today I have with me Cynthia Deeran, who I've known for a few years and she's really an interesting lady. You're going to enjoy this podcast episode because she is an international business strategist, advisor, keynote speaker and author of Amazon bestseller, Camel's Sheiks and Billionaires, your guide to business culture in the Middle East and North Africa. Now that's fascinating, isn't it? Not only that, with 18 years of international experience, she is the founder and managing director of Duran Associates, a consultancy that helps clients to access opportunities and capital in fast growing international markets, including the Middle East, North Africa, Iran, China, Malaysia, and Indonesia. Now, before founding Deeran and Associates, Cynthia worked extensively internationally as an Australian diplomat and a management consultant. She also spent three years as the CEO of the Australian Arab Chamber of Commerce and Industry. She is proficient in Arabic and French, both of which she uses professionally. I'm so impressed. I only speak Cantonese and English, but Arabic and French is unusual, isn't it? That's great. And she's an Australian qualified lawyer, holds a Master of Science in Middle East Politics from the School of Oriental and African Studies in the University of London, and a Bachelor of Laws, Bachelor of International Studies from the University of Technology in Sydney. Now, this is one talented lady. So welcome to the show. Cynthia. Thanks, Jane. It's great to be with you. Yeah, oh, I'm so glad that I managed to catch you because you're so busy and, and you know, you do a lot of travel and so many meetings and you've got lots of speaking engagements and you've got your amazing book as well, which has got such a fantastic name. But as you know, this podcast is all about how you manage amazing career transitions and you've had quite a number. So how about just to kick us off, tell us a little bit about your early career aspirations when you were a young girl. Sure. Well, you know, I think like a lot of children, I had no clue what I really wanted to be when I grew up, when I was small, but people would ask me quite frequently and I got a little bit tired of having to try and invent answers. So when I was 12, my parents had this crazy idea that they would drag us around the world for three months. So they took us to Singapore and then off to Russia, which was still under communist rule, and then to London. And we were in all those places for, for a different length of time. And during that time, my father said to me, well, maybe you would like to become a diplomat. And I said, oh, well, what's a diplomat? And my dad did his best to explain what that was. And because we had this experience of travel and living abroad for, for several months, I think that was really formative for me. And so from about that time, whenever somebody would ask me what it was that I wanted to do when I grew up, partially because I was interested in it and partially to get them off my case, I would just tell them that I wanted to be a diplomat. And so that was, you know, that was uh, something I was really keen on. I also... Um, I was also really keen on teaching as it turns out. And, you know, when I was small, I used to spend a lot of time actually writing curricula for imaginary schools and um, drawing up architectural plans and that kind of thing. So I, I had a couple of directions that I, that I was quite keen on, but those were probably the two main ones. Oh, I should also say um, I, I went through a phase for quite a, a lot of years of wanting to start a business. So I had, we lived in the country at that stage. I was born in Sydney, but we moved to Tamworth in northern New South Wales when I was seven. I had lots of goes at um, trying to create a business. I remember I, I created one called Toy Box Products, which I think was drawstring bags and scrunchies when I was about 10. And so I came up with all these ideas, but my biggest challenge was all, always distribution. So the idea was great and the product was great, but actually getting it out into the market as a 10-year-old living in the middle of the country before internet was something of a challenge. So, you know, those things never really got off the ground, but those are the kind of things that I wanted to do when I was a kid. Mm -hmm. It sounds like you had a, a very much an entrepreneurial mindset uh, from the early days and not having the distribution. It kind of ties in very much with what you're doing today. And uh, we'll, we'll, we'll be getting to that as well. But um, so an interesting childhood, you got to travel, uh, you were thinking of lots of different things. But you know what, for most children, when they're under the age of 10, they don't even know what the word diplomat means. So <laughs> So that opened up a whole world of possibilities for you. Well, my, look, my parents were very keen on giving us the broadest range of experiences that they could. 
And so they really wanted us to be able to go anywhere, do anything, mix with anyone. And they tried to just um, give us as many opportunities to experience different things as possible. And I think that's probably what it was about. And also they never ever said that I couldn't do something. So whatever I wanted to do, they would try and facilitate. And every time I asked my father whether some crazy scheme of mine or other was doable, he would say very cryptically, nothing is impossible. So I think some of that kind of rubbed off. But look, I did some crazy things, Jane. At one stage, I kind of coerced my parents into helping me organise a horse camp where I got kids from all around the district to come and pay money to learn to do riding for a week during the Easter holidays. Uh, I think people used to hate me because of the things that I came up with and forced them into. I had another business called Bovalon Bakery that I made up a jingle for and it had baked products. But again, distribution was a huge problem. I tried to start a newspaper with my friends who lived in Sydney and we would post things to each other back and forth and we would write things up on like an old Apple computer. But again, you know, these things often fell apart with the newspaper it was when my mother said, well, look, this is all good, but how will you actually pay? Printing is very expensive. This is in the 80s. How are you going to print it and how are you going to distribute it? And I kind of went, oh, oh I guess I won't be able to do it. So, you know, I, I kind of wish I'd been born in the internet age because I'm pretty sure I would have had my own online newspaper. Mm, you know, I was just thinking as you were saying all of these things, you were just ahead of your time. <laughs> I was a frustrated totally. online <laughs> journalist. <laughs> totally ahead of your time. And just think, if you were to do all of that now, oh, some lucky 10-year-old is going to get really inspired by you now. Well, you because, know, because they can get up and running, you know, within a day or two because of yeah. everything, you know, it, on the internet now. It just blows my mind the opportunities that even, you know, relatively young children have. I, I, my little boy is 18 months old. I am fascinated to see what he is going to come up with by the time he's about 10 or 12. Mm. I think it's going to be hilarious. Yeah. Well, I think, I think with um, grandparents, like your parents, because so, so, so inspiring for you as well with your entrepreneurial mindset and amazing background, which we need to find out about. I, th I think your 18 month old has, has got a really good start in the world. <laughs> okay. We'll <see>. so, <laughs> so back to you, Cynthia. Okay. So from those early aspirations, when you first graduated and then, then you know, you, or, or before you graduated, when you decided on the subjects that you wanted to study and then when you launched yourself into the world of work in the early days tell us a little bit about those transitions that that you made before you got to where you are today with Deere so, and Associates. So I, I graduated well I mean I did my HSC here in Australia and I decided I would do a law degree now I didn't do a law degree because I wanted to become a lawyer I did a law degree because I knew that the diplomatic corps was well known for often recruiting people with a law degree. And I said, well, I want to get into the diplomatic course. So I will do this law degree. Now I did the law degree. I have to say I did really well at it, but 70% of it, I absolutely hated. I nearly dropped out in the second year because I got so depressed about the fact that I hated what I was studying so much, but I, apparently I'm fairly stubborn because I, I kept going and I came out of it with a first class honors degree. So that was fine. And then everyone said, well, obviously, you know, you're going to apply to go to a, one of the large firms, right? And I'd already decided, you know, because I'd worked in a few firms as a paralegal by then, I just thought, this is not for me. Um, I think this is going to make me really unhappy. There are only bits of the law degree that I liked. I liked all the esoteric stuff, which I couldn't actually use in a job. So, you know, subjects like women in the law or international law, where there's almost no, no work going. And things like um, sale of goods and real property, you know, I remember with a real property exam, I wanted to throw myself down the staircase because I was so freaked out about it and I was, I was going to fail. But I figured that a broken arm would like just postpone the exam for a couple of weeks. So I really didn't want to be a lawyer. So I didn't apply to go to any law firms at all. I applied for a few management consulting firms uh, and I always washed out a couple of rounds into that process. So there was something about how I was that was not a fit for that environment. But at the same time, I also applied to go into the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade as a graduate. And that was um, sometimes, you know, that was, I think the transition out of university into the world of work was quite difficult for me. I remember getting to the end of the degree and just feeling, or being in that final year of my honours and thinking, I don't know what I'm, I don't know what I want to do. I know I don't want to become a lawyer. Maybe this management consultancy thing. And then seeing the application for foreign affairs and trade come up and thinking, oh, that's right. I've been saying since I was little that I wanted to do this. 
I, I should apply for it. Now, I remember, this seems to be a common theme in my life when I'm doing transitions. I remember the day I applied for it online. It was right back when online applications were in their infancy. I think it took me like three goes and the thing crashed halfway through. And I was in a really bad frame of mind. And I was like, oh my gosh, why am I doing this? But I applied. I went through and did, that you had to do an exam back then to get in a couple of rounds of interviews. And I, I wound up getting into foreign affairs and trade as a graduate trainee. And so I was like, wow, um, well, this is what I said I wanted to do. So I packed up my bags in the, um, I guess, in February 2001 and I moved down to Canberra to actually um, to take up that position there. And I basically went and became a graduate trainee. I suppose um, there are a couple of things that probably added to getting into foreign affairs and trade besides the law degree. And that was that my degree was international studies and law. And so I'd done French and Japanese at school and I had to go and spend a year studying in a non-English speaking country. So I went and spent a year at university in France. And then I went back the following year and um, I harassed the people at Australia, at Austrade, so the Australian Trade Commission. I went and harassed them until they gave me an internship. And I went and um, they said, well, we can't really pay you very much. How will you, how will you do this? And I said, oh, well, I will use my own money and a part of it and then I will make up the difference with whatever a small amount you guys paid me. And so I went and actually worked in Paris for four months on a big um, education and language related trade fair where Australia was the host or rather the, the guest of honour um, because it was 2000, it was our bicentenary. So I think that was a real contributing factor to me then getting that spot in DFAT. But that was another really fascinating experience that um, just kept me interested and inspired where international things were concerned. Yeah, I think what's inspiring for me hearing that story is that your tenacity 17 years ago, because even though you thought, okay, well, th this is the path that I think I want. And then when there were opportunities that presented themselves, you actually went out and got them. And, you know, you were convincing people that, you know, give me a go. And even if it's an internship, this is what I want to do. And you were gaining such valuable experience. And yeah, I mean, that's what we have to do in order to get what we want in life, isn't it? it? It's true. But look, I have to say, I think so much of that came from my family. And I think this is often the case. You know, I've been so fortunate because at every step of the way, my family would back me up and if I, they would say, if you want this, you will have to go out and get it. I mean, I remember with the internship, I emailed and there was a bit of back and forth and then it went quiet and they said, but you're surely you're not going to travel all the way here from Australia and find somewhere to live for a few months and do it, are you? And I said, what am I going to do? My mother said, well, just tell them that you'll do it. And then we were over, I took my parents back to France the summer before it started and she said, you will go, get in touch with the person that you've been speaking to and tell them you want to take them to lunch. I was like, what? I hadn't heard of this concept of taking people to lunch before. And she said, Oh, networking. How good is that? <laughs> you know, take them to lunch and, um, you know, take them to lunch and tell them what you want to do and that you're really serious. And so I did. Went and took, and, you know, I'm still, um, I am still friends with that person. This is 20 years later. I was actually speaking to him at an event the other day uh, and somebody very senior said, Oh, you know, Cynthia and Nick, do you know each other? And I said, Yeah, look, Nick and I have known each other for 20 years. Last 20 years, he gave me my first international job as an intern at Austrade. Mm. But really, you know, a lot of that has come from my family because they would back me up and encourage me and say, you know, just take the next step, take the next step, take the next step. Just keep yeah. asking until somebody turns you down. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It makes such a difference when the, the, you've got people on your side to yeah. say, look, if it works out, great. If it doesn't, it's okay. We still Absolutely. love you. Still Absolutely. Mind you, still keep going. And yeah. I think the key is, is you, you never give up. If you want something, you don't. You just give it a go because, you know, the benefits are, are huge. Yeah. And on the downside, it's okay. Well, you develop resilience, don't you? Absolutely. And yeah. look, it doesn't always work out the way you want. And sometimes that's really demoralizing. But yeah. A lot of it is just about being able to pick yourself up again and, um, and say, okay, well, look, that didn't work and that's a shame. Well, what else can we do? Yeah, yeah. So tell me, how did things progress from there? So I joined Foreign Affairs and Trade, as I said, in 2001 as a grad trainee. And you start a grad traineeship by rotating through various areas of the department. But at that time, they promised everybody who was a graduate trainee that, that you, they would have a posting within two years of joining, which is great because obviously... One of the reasons that you join foreign affairs and trade is so that you can work overseas. So, you know, I remember when the round for postings came out, I went and applied and I applied for Colombo, Numea, and Japan. 
and I applied for Colombo because I thought that would be interesting and I applied for Numea because it's French speaking and I speak French and I applied for Japan because at that stage I still had Japanese I've lost it all by now but at that stage my Japanese was still okay and I thought well these all make sense as places to go um, the thing is when you apply for a round of postings at foreign affairs and trade you are essentially saying that you are open to being posted anywhere in the world and so I went down to the staffing department to find a posting list and I got pulled aside and somebody said to me, oh, tell me why you wouldn't want to go and work in the United Arab Emirates. And I went, or they said in Abu Dhabi. And I said, where is that? Is that like, I'm thinking in my mind, is it like, <laughs> I don't even know where it is. So essentially for my sins, foreign affairs and trade said, oh, you have language aptitude. And I went, oh yeah, yeah, I know. And so we would like you to um, study Arabic and then be posted to Abu Dhabi. Mm. And I was completely freaked out, Jane. I was so freaked out. I had to like go out and walk around the block a few times to calm down. Um, <laughs> but I was so, it took me about a week to make up my mind. I was so um, sort of, I guess, uh, intimidated by my employer that I just capitulated and I went, okay, I'll do it. So I packed up a few months later and went off to Egypt and studied Arabic and then, you know, a year or maybe 15 months after that, I went off to the UAE and I was posted to Abu Dhabi. Now, after a time, I went back to Canberra and I was working um, back in Canberra on trade negotiations. And I had, without going into too much detail, I had a few, I had some negative experiences on posting which kind of indicated to me that my employer didn't really care much for my well-being in the way that I felt that they should. And I'd also begun to feel, although being a grad trainee was fantastic, I discovered that when you come back from posting, you kind of get lumped into this huge organisation and you lose, um, you lose the kind of status that you have when you're a grad. And so everything really slows down. So you go from being at post where you have a lot of autonomy to do what you want to being back in this big bureaucratic organization. And I came back and I felt that I couldn't really make a contribution that I wanted. And that every time I asked if I could do something, somebody would say to me, no, no, you're not senior enough. And I, I like to get things done. So after a while, I just, I became really demoralized. I remember like sitting there looking out the plate glass window, wondering if I should punch out the plate glass and jump down to the duck pond, even though it was like <laughs> one or two stories, it wasn't that far, but I felt that I was really stuck. And I also looked around and saw all these very, very bright people who had PhDs and this thing and that thing, still stuck in this large government organization at a relatively low level, even though they'd been there for 10 to 15 years. And I just thought, this is not mm. the right place for me. The big, the big system. You know, it's interesting. You're talking about, you know, like when you were a fresh grad, yeah. then the opportunities were there. Yeah. So often organizations, um, regardless of size, really, they treat their young graduates so well yeah. because you do your rotations and you get all your opportunities and you're amazing because you're the cream of the crop. Yeah. And then when that grad program is over, and especially if you've gone overseas and in Australia, there's this thing, you know, you've been overseas, you've lost touch. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, and, and sometimes it's a little bit like that, isn't it? Oh, you have yeah. the Australian experience, but then once you finish that grad program, then it's like, okay, now it's time for you to do your time. And I've worked with some organizations where the graduates have felt frustrated because after the uh, grad programs are over, where they were very treated very, very well. So yeah. oh, I'm just an employee now and two, three, four, five years go by and they think what's going on. It all happened so fast. Yeah. For a while, and then suddenly I'm stalled. And while you're busy doing your time, and exactly as you've said, you're looking around at all of these highly educated, amazing people who 10 years down the track still haven't got to wherever it is that they might have wanted to be. Um, and so was that the beginning of you thinking, hmm, okay. I mean, uh, it didn't even take me a few years. It took me yeah. six months. So I yeah. was already thinking on posting. I don't think this is right for me long term. And some people who are in the department had said to me, why, you know, if you don't want to do this for your entire life, do five years and then get out. Because otherwise, working for a department like Foreign Affairs and Trade is not like working in a law firm or working for an accounting firm. If you don't like it, you can't switch to another department of Foreign Affairs and Trade. There is only one. And so mm -hmm. if you don't want to do that long term, you need to think about that ahead of time. Because what happens is you get your skill set um, kind of goes in a direction which is 
it's a very sort of specialized direction and it doesn't really apply to any other things. And look, I have to say also, I felt, I didn't feel that my skills were really improving while I was there. And the final straw really came when I had gone and learned Arabic. You know, my Arabic was pretty fluent. I could read, I could write. I thought, look, I don't want to be a generalist. I don't think I've made all this effort to learn. I've been asked to do Arabic. I've gone off. I've done that. I've made a huge investment in it. I'm not, not saying I want to do it forever, but let's get a bit of specialization. And I applied to do a master of Middle East politics in London at the school of Oriental and African studies. And I was accepted. I got in and I went to the staffing department and said, may I have a year of leave without pay to go to London and do my masters? And they said, no, we need you here. And I said, well, why won't you let me go? And they said, Oh, well, we think if we let you go, then you won't come back. And I said, well, if you don't let me go, I'm not coming back either. So could I please go? And they said, no, no, we're not going to let you go. And I said, mm. fine, guys, I'm quitting. Mm. And I did. Um, it was really, really scary. And I kind of was like, oh, my gosh, this is a crazy decision. But I was really not happy. And so I thought, well, I don't care. I'm, this is, I don't want to stay here forever. I want to go get some specialization. I'm going to take the risk. So I quit. I moved back to Sydney for a couple of months. I did a really brief stint at a law firm to kind of just make sure that I really didn't want to be a lawyer. <clears throat> and I was at a firm with some really nice people, but um, uh, they were trying to get, turn me into a property lawyer and I just couldn't, I was, I just hated it so much that I went back and checked for a few months and then I was like, I can't do this. And I remember saying to my parents, am I crazy to go off to London? Should I just stay here in Sydney and be sensible? And they said, are you like, are you for real? You got into a master's in a great school, just go. Mm. And I said, well, what will I do if I can't find a job afterwards? And they said, oh, well, we'll figure it out. Like, I don't know. We'll just figure it out once you do it. So don't worry about that now. Just go and do the master's. And so that was 2005, packed up and went, moved to London <clears throat> by myself and um, did the master's, which was just amazing. I'd do it again in a heartbeat. I can't believe it's already more than 10 years ago that I completed it, but it was one of the best things I ever did. Um, and then once I had finished that, I had thought, look, I really need a bit more time back in the Middle East if I want to say I'm a specialist. So I started asking around and, you know, it's like, I think for so many of these things, the career progression happens through networking. So I had mm -hmm. a, a colleague called Glada Lan at, at Chatham House. And I remember we went to a, it was a sit-in sit protest for the war in Lebanon. It was the wear white protest outside number 10 Downing Street. Mm -hmm. We were there wearing white clothes on a hot summer afternoon in August and talking away. And she asked me, what are you going to do once you finish the masters? We like you're handing in your thesis in a few weeks. What, what are you going to do? And I said, yeah, I think I need some more time in country. Like, who do you think I should talk to? And she said, Oh, it's really interesting. I had a meeting with some guys from a company called Adam Smith international just a few days ago. They're looking for people in places like Libya and Iraq. What do you think? And I went, Hmm. Now, this was in 2006 by this stage. Mm. So this was right in the middle of the Iraq war. Yeah. <laughs> but I, because um, apparently I'm a bit nuts, mm. I went off and got in touch with um, the person she put me in touch with. And I think I wrote to them on a Monday via email. I was in their office on Tuesday afternoon. And on Wednesday, they offered me a job to actually go to Iraq. <laughs> Brave woman, a brave woman. Yes. Okay. You were up for the challenge. I was. So yeah. I thought, well, I'll just go and do six months in Iraq because then I can legitimately say I've had a bit more Middle East experience. Mm -hmm. So I think I went back to Australia for a couple of weeks and then got ready and went out to Iraq. Um, six months turned into nearly four years. So I, I, I transitioned from being a diplomat to a master's student to a management consultant within the space of a year. Um, and then I was on a series of consulting projects. So I was first with the British government for several months. I then did an EU contract for a very short time, replacing somebody who'd broken their leg in Belgrade, slipping on black ice mm. on leave home. Uh, once that was over, by the time that contract was over, I'd picked up another contract with the U S government working with a firm called bearing point, which is a KPMG spinoff. And I did that for 18 months and I, I only rolled off that project because the war situation, the post-conflict situation really he heated up and we had people kidnapped off our project and some of those people 
uh, did not ever come back. So they were basically uh, political casualties of the, of the conflict. Uh, we went through a period of time where we were very heavily rocketed and, you know, we lost five people up the road at the American Embassy, which was 500 metres away from where we were located. And at that point, I said to my boss, you know, this project is not going super well. I don't think it's doing much for my career and I'm a bit concerned that I'm not going to see out the weekend at the rate we're getting hit with rockets. You know, this was sitting in my trailer on a Friday wearing body armour and a helmet mm. and just being aware that if a rocket came down on my trailer, there was absolutely nothing I could do. So <laughs> I, I kind of I rolled off that project after a year and a half and then I went back to London and kept working for Bearing Point on mm -hmm. different projects and then I... I was recruited back to Iraq in October of 2008 once the situation had really calmed down on a much better contract. Mm. So, you know, there was this massive step change. I was suddenly hired back because I had Arabic, because I had law and because I'd already worked there. And that was one of, that was probably my favourite project ever. So I was working on economic reconstruction for um, the US Department of Defence and we were doing things like looking at uh, legal contracts that oil companies were signing with foreign companies and making sure that they didn't get um, ripped off. I was creating uh, legal English training for attorneys and translators from the Ministry of Oil. So I was getting to do some of these things that came from my past. You know, the, the teaching bit, which I'm so keen on, was there. The Arabic was there. The international piece was there. So I really, really enjoyed that. And I only that contract finished in 2010 and I had the option of either um, continuing on to Afghanistan. I was really homesick by then because I'd been bouncing around the world since 1998 because I'd also been to university in France and I'd essentially moved internationally every 18 months for a decade. And so at that point, anytime somebody mentioned moving to a new place, tears would spring into my eyes and I would start to feel like I was going to cry. And I thought, I think it's time to go home. Mm -hmm. I don't think I've been in Iraq for years. I'm not sure I can actually handle going to Afghanistan on the back of Iraq and the UAE and London and Egypt. So I actually moved back to Australia in 2010 and I took up uh, a role as the CEO of the Australia Arab Chamber of Commerce. So, you know, I shifted sectors again. I went from private sector, kind of big corporate, but big corporate in a crazy post-conflict environment back to industry association in Sydney. And I did that for two and a half years. Mm -hmm. And that was, um, look, that came with its own set of challenges. I have to say that was probably the most political and most difficult environment that I ever had to work in. And I found it really difficult being a female CEO with a, you know, a board comprised pretty much entirely of old white guys um, where there was lots and lots of politics going on. So we made some really huge changes while I was there. Uh, I led a, you know, a rebrand and reposition of the entire organisation and basically took it from being an organisation that nobody had ever heard of to an organisation where we had two international conferences two years running and we had trade ministers and government reps from the Arab world coming out to Australia. Uh, and that was all great, but I, after about two and a half years of that, I just thought, I can't handle the politics of this anymore. Um, I'm having to fight battles all the time to do things, and it's just, um, yeah, it's time for me to do something new. So mm -hmm. I, uh, I, I had actually, and look, I'm sure some of the people listening to this will have, understand this experience, Jen. I had been looking around for about a year before I decided that I would actually leave to find something that suited better. But coming back to Australia from abroad was very, very difficult because people would look at my CV and say, oh, we love your CV. Oh, it's so exotic. We have no idea what to do with you. Exactly. That's what I was thinking because... Yeah, and I, I would I'd point out... To here. Well, look, I would point out I have all these transferable skills. I've been rebuilding another country. You know, I can problem solve is it, can you not find something for me to do? And everybody was like, oh, you don't have any local experience. No, no, can't hire you. And I, I, I found that really difficult. So, I, you know, I went from having a really senior position for my age. So I was a one level below director in a big five consulting company out of the States back to Australia where suddenly I just, I couldn't even get, anything that was a job outside this very specialised area of the Arab world. 
And I, I have to say, I found it really disheartening. So mm. I was just, you know, it did really bad things to my confidence. And I just thought, how will I ever find another job? I think I'm unemployable. Maybe, maybe it's me, you know? Yeah. You know, you know, it's, it's interesting because when you think about everything that you've been through, so it's also, I mean, it's the physical challenges of being in a highly volatile environment where, you know, there were rockets going off and also your personal safety was at risk as well. And yet still getting the job done to, you know, being a, a leader within an organization where you also had to do battle with, um, being a female in a leadership position with a lot of males who probably you know, would have been quite a, it would have been a very challenging environment for you to get your ideas and to get things implemented you know as a woman as well there's so many challenges but you, you've had such resilience and tenacity in order to be able to get through all of that and i'm just thinking as well oh, it would have just played havoc with your personal life <laughs> okay just well it, 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 it did, to be really transparent, you know, a, a lot of people don't know this, but I was, I met somebody in Iraq and married that person and then they moved back to Australia with me and um, for a whole variety of reasons, but, you know, I'm sure that all the difficult circumstances were a contributing factor. That really didn't, that did not work out. And so, you know, um, I th we were together for about seven years in total and then it just broke up. And a lot of that was... Um, Oh, look, cultural differences and all that kind of stuff. But also I think um, all those difficult environments do put you under and your relationships under a huge amount of strain. Mm, mm, that's right. And sometimes when, when you're in a challenging environment, you kind of pull together, you know, we're in this together. Yeah. And then when you're in a, a, a non-conflict zone, you come back to Australia and it's just like normal life again. The whole day yeah. would change, wouldn't it? And so that, look, the, That's absolutely right. Yeah. And, and look, one of my top tips is to people who are like traveling and working abroad, don't ever get married to somebody you meet in a war zone. <laughs> Wise advice, Cynthia Deering. <laughs> thank, you, thank you for sharing that. I'll, I'll take note of that next time I'm in a war zone. <laughs> 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 okay, now what I want to do now is moving forward, Deering and Associates. You are yes. doing incredible work with Deering and Associates and helping businesses, you know, to, to actually gain the capital and also to develop opportunities so that businesses can grow overseas. You had this focus um, originally on the Middle East and now you've expanded into uh, the, the Asia Pacific region as well. Tell me a little bit about this. You, you, you started your own business, Deering and Associates. What does it do and what is it that you offer? Sure. So essentially, we're an international business consulting firm that helps companies to take what they do well in the home market and to expand it internationally and for the ones who are really good at it globally. So all over the place. Now, why do we do this? Well, essentially, my experience abroad and my experience in particular running a chamber of commerce really demonstrated to me that there's never been a better time for companies to look internationally because barriers to entry are so much lower than they've ever been in the past. Um, and at the same time, there is a real lack of capacity um, in especially the, the micro to medium sector, but across the business community where international business is concerned. So what I mean by that is that there are loads more opportunities for people to operate internationally and there is a real imperative for them to do that, but companies don't know how. So the vast majority of companies don't have the time, the resources or the expertise to actually get themselves internationally ready and then to go into the international space and make a success of it. So we help companies to do that and the, the, the kind of the flagship product that we have is a thing called the International Business Accelerator, which is a program specifically designed to speed up and de-risk that process of internationalization for micro to medium sized companies. Mm, okay, I think, I mean, that would be so valuable because so many organizations don't know how to do this. And having someone who understands the region that they're trying to, to expand into, um, almost like hand-holding in a way, so that you can That's right. that process is, is really valuable. So it's called the International Business Accelerator? Yes. Yeah. And you'll be having these on an ongoing basis throughout the year, or is it just a one-off? Yes, we run them on a rolling basis and just mm -hmm. depending on, uh, you know, it's sort of dependent on when we fill a, a group, mm -hmm. but we prefer it if we can actually run them quarterly 
-hmm. and we can have a cohort starting every few months and then going through. So the program itself goes for uh, around 12 months, although we're adding a lot of material in as we go. So it's starting to, to become a little bit longer because there are more things that people have asked us to cover. And uh, uh, essentially the way it works is that you come along and you join a group of like-minded visionary business owners who are all striving to take their business international. And it's a combination of skills and knowledge. So we actually teach piece by piece all the things that you need to do and all the questions you need to answer to make sure that your, your company can successfully internationalize. There's also an individual coaching piece. So we coach companies one-on-one -on -one to get them ready to go overseas and to work on their specific challenges. We also partner them up with an accountability buddy out of the program. So they're working with another company who's also internationalizing. And they, usually the companies have nothing in common with each other, but they come at these questions from different perspectives and people find that really helpful you know, to get feedback from other people. And they also just find that it keeps them on track because they're checking in with somebody every week or two. And so there's a real imperative for them to have got all their, their assignments and their pieces of homework finished. Mm -hmm. And then there's a, a community piece. So we, um, we are curating a series of partnerships with different companies who can help all of our clients to go overseas. So we work with government departments who provide financing. We work with accountants who give specialized international tax advice. We work with consultants who can help you to get a grant so you can get, um, you know, half the money that you spend on marketing internationally back. We work with lawyers, we work with translation companies. So we're really trying to create a community where you can go and get the support you need from people that we know are uh, likable and trustworthy and will do a great job at helping you to take your company offshore. Yeah, yeah, it's so important to have that pool of um, professionals who are able to assist when it comes to liaising with certain governments and obviously all the tax implications because it gets so complicated in certain countries as well. So you help yeah. um, organizations in any industry. In any industry and mm -hmm. also in any country because mm -hmm. our, the program uh, at this point in time runs entirely digitally. So mm -hmm. we run it on a, on a platform called Zoom and we can meet up with the class meets up and we can all see each other and talk and ask questions, but it's digital. And that we found that that's really great for people who are scattered across the world because they don't have to travel to access the, the knowledge and the community. Mm -hmm. It's great for people. If we're talking about Australia in rural, regional and remote Australia, because they don't have to get in a car and drive to Sydney or a major center to attend. And it's great for busy working mums who are chained to the house at all hours of the day because they can come to the class if they can get there or if they can't, then uh, we record all the sessions so they can actually just go and download their session and, and watch it at, a time that works for them. Yeah, it's exactly like we're doing now because this is this is being recorded via Zoom. Yeah. And I know with, with all of my coaching, because I have clients who are overseas as well, um, you don't need to fly in or you don't need to travel or drive or park and it makes it so much easier. And I think the most valuable thing is being able to record the sessions so that you can provide those to you know everyone who has dialed in uh, for your group meetings or individual meetings and use it as an ongoing resource moving yeah. forward. I think that's valuable. That That's a really comprehensive 12 month program that you've put together, Cynthia. I think it's going to help a lot of businesses who, who may be just a little bit fearful of expanding overseas. And so with that guidance and especially having the accountability buddy to keep you going when the going gets tough and it will get go, the going does get tough, doesn't it? Yes, um, it does at times. <laughs> so your first one um, is launching on the 24th of January. Yeah. So our first one launched in May this year, mm -hmm. uh, and this will actually be our third group. Well, mm -hmm. our, our, our open day is on the 24th of January, and then we, we kick off in February. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, we're, we're getting started early in the year so that, you know, people can hit the ground running and actually get their international planning off to a start early in 2018. Yeah. And if they miss that one, then in the next quarter, there will be another one. So you're going to yeah. have this ongoing process um, you know, over, over the years as well, where more and more businesses will join and, and go through the process. And I look forward to hearing all the success stories. Well, look, my, my wild ambition is that in the next decade, we actually manage to, to reach a million businesses around the world because I just see, I see so much opportunity, especially for the micro to medium sector. You know, mm -hmm. I see an opportunity for people to transform 
uh, their lives and the communities around them by the contributions that they can make. Mm. And I, I, I'm really excited that we can have a role in making that happen, you know, to, to affect change for people personally, for communities and on a big scale to, um, to really empower economies to do better by helping all those small players to actually grow and, and reach um, customers in other markets. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I mean, that's so important too. So you've obviously got your heart in the right place. So, you know, to run a commercial concern that actually is community focused, I think is really, really important. Um, And so I have to say, thank you so much, Cynthia. We need to find out where to find you. So I'll have all of this in my show notes in my, on my website at janejacksoncoach.com. But tell us if someone wants to hop on and find out more about you and your business, where do they go? Okay, so if you'd like to find out about the International Business Accelerator, uh, you just go to internationalbusinessaccelerator.com. It's a little long, I know, but we couldn't get IBA. It was already taken. So internationalbusinessaccelerator.com. And if you want to go to the open day, you just add forward slash open dash day to the end of it. And if you would like to find out about Deeran and Associates more generally, you just go to Deeran. D-E-A-R-I-N associates.com. Perfect. And also if anyone wants to follow you on Twitter, it's Cynthia Deeran. I'll have that link as well in my (laughs) show notes. So let's follow Cynthia on Twitter too. So any parting parting messages, Cynthia? Ah, look, I would just say, um, I would say if you're thinking about taking your business international, don't be afraid. It's easier than you think. And if we're talking about your career, I just say make sure that you you do something that you love. Um, be brave and don't be discouraged if things don't work out exactly how you think they're going to. And if you don't go in a straight line, well, that's okay. There are many ways to be right. If you have to do a zigzag to get where you want to go or even if you wind up somewhere totally different, as long as you're waking up every day happy and enjoying what you're doing, that is really all that matters. Mm-hmm. Can I just add that it might be a good idea not to go to a war zone? <laughs> <laughs> well, it depends what you're trying to get done. <laughs> well, yes, exactly. Okay. <laughs> You've had such a fascinating life and I have to say thank you to your parents for encouraging you to do all of these amazing things. It's been so interesting having you on the show. Thank you so much, Cynthia. And I reckon in, say, two quarters time, you should come back and let's find out how the IBA has gone. I'd love to do that. That'd be fantastic. Wonderful. Thanks so much, Cynthia. Thanks, Jane. (laughs) Talk soon. Bye.